Hello, everyone. Can you see me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. If everyone see me clearly, please wave your hands. Okay. Good. Huh? This is Alice from Beijing. So I think many of you know me because I'm so talkative. I always talk everything. I'm talkative. And uh, but here last several months, I think I got something wrong because I almost lost my voice. Why? Because I stay at home. I have no one to talk. Yeah, you know, I have my family members, they all know me for so long time. They all get enough for my talk. Yeah, so I got so boring. So I think what's wrong? I need to talk with others. Then I think, okay, all of you need talks. But I think of my students, they all stay at home. Especially every week we can have a group meetings. But all other times they won't have enough people to talk. Normally they stay in the lab so they can talk with each other. So they make friends, they go to cutting together, you know, they go to movie together. They do something exchange ideas. This was a talk to everyone. But I think, you know, recently the verses was the goal of the world. Everyone was blocking home. Everyone was look like, you know, have nobody to talk and have nothing, you know, to do with all of others. So that's a word like to get isolated. We all isolated in home. We all isolated, you know, with others. This got a big problem because of people, why are you leaving? Because you can talk with each other. You can exchange ideas. You can make friends. That's all based on your talks. But now if we couldn't talk with each other, looks like we got isolated, we got loose connected. So this was not only not good for the research, but it's not good for the human beings. So I think I need to do something because I need to talk with others. You need to talk with others. And we all need to talk with others. You know, from the whole world, everyone need to talk with others. So that's why I hope this I can ask talks. Uh, we want to make talks with others. We want to like, get others to listen to our talks. We want to share and exchange the ideas. So this I can talk, so I get the idea. Then I send the email. I try to say, okay, can we have a talk? Can we have a talk online? Oh, certainly, certainly, you know. I get people reply me minutes, especially my great friends, John Rogers. No, Rogers, are you here? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I write first email to writers. Yeah, I say, okay, John. Yeah, I want to have a talk. I want to, you know, have something to talk with others. Can you join me, you know, to give a talk to others and let like, the people can reconnect it. And the people can, you know, exchange their lives, you know, by this online talk. Now we couldn't talk face to face, but we can talk online. We can gather the people, you know, listen to a talk and also reply and ask your questions for this, you know, reconnections. Just a minutes, you know, he answered my email. I say, oh yeah, I'd love to do that. Then all these friends answer my email, you know, in minutes. Uh, Tony, are you here? Yeah, Tony is on opening speech too, because he's the second one answer my email. You know, you're not faster like John. Yeah. So you are second one answer my email. Now you are second, uh, second speakers. Yeah. So all these people are from a different place. John was from uh, Chicago, and Tony was in the, you know North Carolina, and uh, Yoga was a uh, Yoga. Are you there? Yeah. So yeah, Yoga was uh, from EPFL Swiss. He said I was in Europe, right? Yeah, so Yoga was in Europe, it's my great friend. I sent an email to him, I said, Yoga, are you okay? Uh, with talks, you always listen to my talks, you know? Yeah, we always talk with each other. We have very good collaborations. So Yoga say, yes, we need talks, you know? We need to, yeah, talks with us, each other. So we get everyone here, we get everyone talk. So uh, Yoga was from Swiss, now he's online and with us. And uh, Xian He, 
uh, from MIT, Chen He, are you there? Yeah. So we all see his papers, you know, for publications almost every week, you know, new papers come out. So I say, okay, I want to listen to your talks. Chen He say, okay, I also need to talk with others. So I want, I like these online talks. So Chen He, I'll do that again. And Chen Jiang, are you there? Yeah. Chen Jiang was with, uh, you know, very, very green screen. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, yeah, very good at the talks too. So yeah, that's how the people that connect each other, get out this online talk show. So now is I can add the talks come out because the whole world need talks, need online talks to make everyone understand each other, to make friends, to make this connection, to make the understandings, to keep warmer, to keep friendly and to keep all these kind of right feelings and good feelings for the futures. Not only, you know, we are isolated in home because we need to be reconnected. We need to build a new things. So this was the reason for I pulled out and they said this, I can add the parks. I thank you all my friends. You know, because all these friends are here, they are doing so good and they give me a big, big hands. That's why in three days, we got this I can ask talks online, you know, just three days. That's the most speedy things, you know, yeah, to come out. And then we will continue for these talks, you know, during this special time period. And uh, we want to, you know, keep everyone Talks with each other, not only listen to talks, also talk with each other, change ideas to make everyone keep warmer and keep the good feelings. So today is a new, new day, it's a new time and it's a new thing. So we want to do it once as every week. Every Friday, we all get online. We invited the top scientists to join us and to give talks. We listen to your talks too, because our questions and, and online and offline you know, discussions, we all get all these things together. We all get all these people reconnect on the internet and reconnect by these talks. So please be sure, stay with us for these ICAX talks. So now is a good time. Let me invite you know, all my friends to open this I can add the talks. Let everyone do it this way. I try my uh, first, then you guys, you know, do it together with me. Okay. Let I can add the talks go. Okay. Now we do that again. Okay. Let I can add talks go. Okay. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I like this opening. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, now it's my, you know, short opening. I think this opening ceremony, you know, is good. Everyone can, if you like my talk, you can listen to this repeat again, again, again. You know, this was the best thing for the online talks because we are recording this. I put the videos, you know, you can repeat. Yeah. So, but I couldn't, you know, spend too many times because John, yeah, it's the best speaker, you know, I ever heard. Yeah, not only his big titles, you know, everyone know he was the members of the National Academy, National okay, yeah, Engineer, and all this, so many, many titles. We have him a name, it's a title collector because he really got so many, you know, titles and but, you know, these all based on his achievement. I think that everyone was read paper, his papers, not only once, maybe tens of times, or maybe thousands of times. And John was really good speaker. Now, I heard his uh, speech several times. Every time I was excited because I think, okay, our world is so good. We can do something to change the world. So we can do something for the high tech to change the world. So John is the first speaker. I don't have, uh, you know, to stay here for a long time, you know, to uh, have you block you. So now I want to invite my great friend, John, are you ready? Yes, yes, Okay. okay. The word is yours. Now please oh, yes. share your first slice. Okay, yeah. So welcome, okay. John. All right, thank you. Okay, good. Please share your screen, yeah. Yeah. 
Cool. So I want to start by uh, thanking Alice for uh, putting putting together this series of talks. Uh, I think it's going to be a great mechanism for my students to stay engaged and, and many, many other people uh, around the world uh, as well. And um, I can um, sort of verify that uh, Alice is in fact very talkative, but she's also very creative and very energetic and very active. Uh, and she's really taken the initiative here to to create something that, that I think is gonna be really powerful and, and useful for people, not only during this unusual period, but maybe uh, going forward into the future as well. This, this may be um, you know, a really great mechanism to facilitate communication across you know, various you know, aspects of the, of the scientific and engineering research communities, because I think um, you know, progress is really uh, driven by exchange of, of ideas and conversations and, um, and talking about uh, diff different opportunities. So, so I'm really um, honored to have a chance to, to give a, a presentation in this ICANX Talks series. And I'm also sort of um, in, I've, uh, sort of interested to to learn that um, you know I was selected partly because I responded to my uh, to uh, Alice's email request very quickly. So maybe that's a lesson, you know, early bird gets gets the worm type of thing. So so be responsive, you know, and um, uh, and and engage where where possible. So so anyway, uh, enough with with sort of sort of background. I've I've put together a, a set of slides here. I think it'll take me probably 50 minutes or so to present this this content. Uh, but I hope you find it interesting, and um, I'm looking forward to the question and answer session following the talk because because a lot of times that's sort of the most engaging and, and enjoyable uh, parts of talks is is that interaction you know that happens uh, after the formal presentation. So what I've done is I pulled together uh, a set of slides that that cover uh, technologies and uh, aspects of engineering science that my group has been working on over the last uh, several years, but but really focusing, I guess, on the most recent developments. Uh, and, and that's kind of where I'll spend most of my time. And um, the, the area of uh, technology and science is in the development of electronic and microfluidic systems that uh, are adapted and, and sort of designed explicitly to facilitate integration with the human body. And I'll try to provide a little bit of a, a background and, and motivation and context around what we're doing in this area uh, with specific examples, at least um, you know, at a high level in what we're calling epidermal or, or skin-like electronic devices, just to orient you to the basic design strategies, the, the kinds of materials that we've been exploring for these systems. But most of the talk will focus on our most recent work in microfluidic lab on a chip type technology is adapted for the skin. And, and I'll show you how those kinds of uh, systems can be used to capture very minute, tiny volumes of sweat as it emerges from the surface of the skin in a way that allows us to, to capture that uh, class of biofluid and to perform detailed biomarker analysis uh, to look at uh, concentrations of different chemical species in sweat as a way to gain insights into health status and to uh, you know, uh, provide vehicles for improving sports performance, uh, physical uh, uh, fitness and, and wellness in, in general. And, and these are um, you know, platforms that we've been working on just over the last few years, um, but, but they are now um, you know, in early stages of commercial launch uh, with uh, a large company partner. And I'll try to give you a sense of uh, where things are going on that front as well. So not strictly academic science, uh, but, but also sort of commercial application to just give you uh, a sense of what might be possible you know, as we move into the future. So as Alice uh, mentioned, you know, uh, I have a number of different department affiliations. My, my home department is material science and engineering. I feel that that's my own sort of uh, area of core expertise, but a lot of what we do involves, um, you know, considerations not just at the base material level, but all the way up to uh, systems that, that can be uh, launched, you know, at, at scale to, for broader impact. And as a result, uh, you know, our programs involve expertise in electrical and computer engineering, chemistry, biomedical engineering, mechanical engineering, and so on. So, so the group is a, is a large interdisciplinary uh, collection of students and postdocs with uh, deep expertise in all of these uh, areas. 
Uh, and the other point to make is that a lot of what we do, and uh, you'll get a sense for that as I uh, move through the presentation, is really um, at the boundary but between engineering science and uh, medical science and um, thinking about ways to, to use advanced concepts in engineering to ultimately improve uh, human health. And as a result, we have very strong ties to our medical school here at Northwestern, and I have a paid appointment in neurological surgery. So I'm not a surgeon, but we work very closely with, uh, with neurosurgeons to develop new technologies to address um, unmet clinical needs. So anyway, that, that's an overview of um, you know, the presentation uh, today. And to um, provide kind of a high level uh, picture uh, around what we're trying to do at that medical engineering uh, interface, it's really an attempt to reformulate man-made technologies, microsystems technologies like uh, electronic integrated circuits, optoelectronic platforms, as you'll see microfluidic systems, microelectromechanical systems, uh, to change them in a fundamental way to, to allow them to, to adapt and uh, integrate for, for long periods of time with soft surfaces and, and volumetric depths of uh, biological tissues with, with an orientation around the human body ultimately, but a lot of the work that we do uh, is at the cellular level and at the level of animal model studies. So one way to, to think crisply about uh, what, what I mean here is to, to think about the human brain as, as a very sophisticated form of electronics, biology's most sophisticated form of electronics, uh, in, in fact. Uh, incredibly powerful in, in many ways, uniquely uh, designed. And if you want to understand the basic fundamental operating principles of the brain, it's a, it's a piece of electronics in a sense. It might make sense to try to adapt man's most sophisticated form of electronics, the uh, silicon CMOS integrated circuit, uh, to be compatible with the brain to allow those two systems to be merged uh, together so that the uh, electronics could be used to map uh, electrical impulses and signals uh, that are governing the behavior of the brain, or to use that same piece of electronics to electrically stimulate responses in the brain that could be used potentially to address various brain disorders. And so in order to do that, you really have to fundamentally change the, um, you know, the physical format and, and the classes or materials that are used in the kinds of integrated circuits that occur in consumer gadgetry, which are built around rigid planar uh, so, uh, semiconductor wafer substrates, uh, much, much different than the soft curvilinear textures of the brain. You really have to think about electronics as a soft uh, mechanically soft technology that could gently but conformally wrap the, the contours towards surfaces of the brain and move with the natural motions uh, of the brain to allow that intimate interface in a way that's not destructive you know, to the underlying tissue. And, and so in order to do that, it really requires a whole new set of ideas around electronic materials and mechanical science and engineering, electrical engineering, and so on. And so, so I think that sets a framework for um, you know, a, a set of research activities that, that can be uh, both of interest from a fundamental academic science standpoint, but also with the potential to impact human health. So, so that's kind of what we're doing. And if, uh, and, and many other groups around the world, by, by the way, not, not just us. And so I think it ser serves as a compelling direction for, for research, at, at least from, from our perspective. Um, and if you could do that with, with the brain, you probably wouldn't want to stop there because there are a lot of internal vital organ systems that could benefit from uh, electronic uh, integration. The heart is another one. It's an electromechanical system. And if you could develop a thin, soft membrane that could surround the outside surface of the heart, maybe you could map electrical activity, maybe stimulate in complex spatio temporally controlled ways to really uh, augment the behavior of the heart, improve the health of the heart, and the longevity of the heart would, would, would be the, the idea. Um, the skin is, is another uh, organ that you might think about as a point of integration. It's the largest organ uh, of the human body and really probably a great starting point for research in this area because it's very easily, easy to non-invasively integrate devices of this type with, with the skin. And, and that's where we've spent most of our time, but we also have active areas in brain, heart, uh, kidney, bladder, spinal cord, and peripheral nerves. Uh, as well. So if you think about the skin, you might uh, immediately think we're talking about wearable technology. And in a sense, we are. But um, 
we're we're doing that in in a radically different way than than you would uh, maybe naively expect. So there are many, uh, as you know, commercial devices in this wearable segment, and they have all different sorts of functions and different companies behind them. But if you look at the underlying engineering principles, they're all pretty much the same. It's uh, a rigid block of electronics, display technology, battery, radio, and so on, loosely coupled to the body with a strap, typically around the wrist. And uh, you can support a lot of interesting functionality here, but without that intimate, direct physical interface with the skin, you're limited uh, in, in the kinds of measurements uh, that you can make and the, and the kinds of interfaces that, that are possible. And it's fundamentally limit, limiting. And I think it will never support the kind of vital signs, sort of clinical grade quality uh, in data streams that, that one would uh, ultimately want uh, as, as a way to sort of track uh, health, health status. And so uh, I won't go, th go through the details. Like I said, we're, we're very active in this area. A number of other you know, really top groups uh, around the world are, are also active. Uh, Kan Jeng Yu is on the phone. He's at University of Houston doing a lot of great work here. Jean Bao at uh, Stanford, on and on. Lot, lots and lots of uh, people, many people in China as well. And um, at this point, we and others sort of have a whole you know, portfolio tool chest of uh, te technologies, electronic technologies that have those features. And the idea is, at least for us, to take uh, intensive care unit monitoring capabilities out of the hospital, get rid of the wires, allow that kind of data to be collected continuously in a home setting without disrupting natural daily activities. That, that's the vision and to provide that data uh, to machine learning algorithms and ultimately to physicians to allow them to pick up very early signs of uh, health disorders would, would be one, one way to think about it. And so I won't go through the details. We've been working on this for, for a long time. I think we felt like we kind of knew what we were doing. Um, starting around 2011 was maybe the first paper, got a little bit better in 2014. And 2019 really represented an important milestone for us because we were able to put it all together in the context of a, a, an important clinical need uh, and meet all the requirements ultimately that, that are needed for uh, practical use of these kinds of approaches and then deploy them at scale around the world. I think we're in 15 countries now. So the idea, again, is to create you know, electronic technologies that offer all the sophistication and function that you would find in a piece of consumer gadgetry uh, based on a rigid planar type of technology in a skin-like format uh, that can integrate you know, in an imperceptible fashion onto the surface of the skin, much like a, a Band-Aid or, or a temporary tattoo. That, that's the way you can think about it. And uh, it's, it's really possible to, to do all these things uh, at, at this point. Now, this talk uh, is not geared around that technology specifically. I'm just sort of highlighting it because it provides a useful context around what we're doing in microfluidic sweat analytics uh, systems. But the idea, just to give you a flavor, is to um, figure out ways to combine hard materials and soft materials into mechanical metamaterials, in, in a sense, that are engineered to have mechanical characteristics precisely matched to the biological surfaces at a targeted point of integration. So that could be the skin uh, in, in the context of what, what I'll talk about in the next few slides. And so it's really, um, you know, from a material science uh, standpoint, a, an effort to determinist, deterministically engineer a hard, soft material composite, but to engineer it with a full nonlinear stress strain response that is tailored to that of a, a, a biological system. And, and it turns out it's possible to do this using these kind of filamentary serpentine networks uh, of hard materials, where, where all, the hard materials are providing all the electronic functionality, and they get embedded into a soft elastomer uh, that provides the elastic restoring force. And those hard material networks combined with the soft material matrix uh, yield a composite system uh, that offers electronic functionality, but with biocompatible mechanics at the same time. And I won't go through all the details, but with a key collaborator here uh, at Northwestern, Young Gong Huang, who's a theoretical mechanician, uh, we're able to develop inverse design algorithms. So we can um, dial in the geometries of these filaments, the, the widths, the thicknesses, the curvatures, and so on, combined with the intrinsic mechanical properties of the uh, matrix elastomer 
to uh, really match uh, nonlinear stress strain responses to, to various parts of the skin. And, and you can do this in a very generic way that's compatible across a very wide range of uh, inorganic uh, materials, uh, including silicon, uh, there, thereby providing a very robust route to uh, sophisticated classes of electronics in biocompatible form. So the mechanics are important, but you also have to think about the topology and the ability of these devices really to, to follow the textures uh, that you see in biological surfaces. This is a scanning electron micrograph of a filamentary serpentine network, one of these 2D networks that supports all the electronic functionality, resting on a polymer replica of skin, human skin. And uh, you can see how this kind of geometric configuration gives you not only the mechanics through this kind of mechanical metamaterial structure, but also the geometry that you ultimately need for robust adhesion and also a low impedance interface for making measurements where you're using the skin as a window into uh, quantifying uh, various aspects of underlying physiological processes, beating of the heart, activity in the brain, uh, and so on. So that's what it is. I, I'm not going to get into the details. We probably published 50, 100 papers on various kinds of biosensor technologies that can be dropped into that kind of framework. A lot of other groups have contributed in very important ways to this uh, you know, emerging field of study. But, but you can really do a lot of things. And you can do things at a level that reproduce what's done in the clinic and the hospital today, but again, applicable outside of a hospital and home setting. But then you can go beyond. It turns out that you can do a lot that even exceeds what, what's currently done uh, in, in the hospital. That's a very exciting you know, frontier area in, in this, in, in this uh, field of study. It's not, not just reproducing what physicians understand today, but providing additional insights through novelty at the level of the, of the sensor technology. And, and that's, that's a direction we and many others are, are going very rapidly. But if you ask, you know, you have this technology, what's it good for? We decided uh, maybe five years ago that the most compelling opportunity would be to address the, the most fragile patients that you would encounter in, in a hospital setting, premature babies. And uh, they're currently monitored with uh, wired-based systems, uh, bi biosensors that are adhered to the uh, skin with adhesive tapes. Uh, and then connected to external boxes of electronics with wires. And um, this does the trick in terms of the, the measurement fidelity, but, but it's, um, it's highly invasive to, to these patients because uh, the wires frustrate their natural movements. Uh, the adhesive tapes are typically so strong to keep these uh, skin when they're peeled away. And the wires also frustrate uh, interactions with, with parents. And so, we decided maybe five, five and a half years ago that if we could really make this skin-like technology work the way that we had hoped that we would be able to make it work, we would immediately get rid of all the wires, replace them maybe with uh, you know, two or three of these skin-like patches uh, to perform the same type of monitoring. And um, I won't go through the details this, uh, for another talk, but it turns out you can do all of that. We, we published it in Science uh, about this time last year. So it's two devices, one goes on the chest, one goes on the foot, they're battery free, they're, they're wireless in their operation, they're skin-like in their construction using the kind of design approaches I, I just described to you, but, but they allow the, the wires to go away completely. And this is a, a picture of one of these devices, the, the, the chest unit on a premature baby, baby that was delivered 31 weeks. And you can see that the hand of uh, you know, one, one of the attending physicians, that's Aaron Hombas, he's head of neonatology at Lurie Children's Hospital here in Chicago, just to set the size scale. So this has been a very important effort for us. Uh, we've moved from the neonatal intensive care unit, the NICU, expanded into the PICU, that's the pediatric intensive care unit. There's big, bigger babies, but they still require wired-based monitoring systems. And these skin-like wireless technologies uh, provide a vast improvement uh, in, in the, in the uh, standard of care for these, uh, for these kids. And they allow the, the parents to more naturally and more frequently uh, engage with, with, their, uh, with their child. And, and that has a very strong therapeutic benefit uh, to the de natural development, healthy development of the babies. And you can see the, uh, the chest unit here 
uh, the limb unit here, this is doing blood oxygenation, this is doing uh, electrocardiogram recording, that's uh, photoplethysmography. So that, that's the way it works. I won't say much more about that. Um, we were fortunate enough to receive a large grant from the uh, Gates Foundation and the Save the Children Foundation to take that technology out of sort of a sophisticated NICU unit that we have in he, uh, here in Chicago and distribute it into the developing world where they don't have any monitoring technologies at all. Uh, wired or wireless or otherwise. And uh, it turns out the cost structure of these devices is very attractive, allows you to begin to think about that. Uh, even in very resource constrained settings, they, became, they become a very viable uh, option. So, so in order to do this, we had to modify the technology from, from that original report. We just published this just a few weeks ago. And it's a, a really low cost deployable platform, does all the same type of measurements, uh, but it even goes beyond. And um, so we're now uh, in the middle of a deployment, a 10,000 unit deployment into India, Pakistan, Zambia, Kenya, and Ghana. So we went into uh, Zambia and Kenya. Those two countries were first in October. I spent a few weeks in Zambia myself in December. Uh, and, it's, and it's quite touching. And um, you know, it, it, it really is make, making a difference. And uh, you know, we're, we're pushing very hard uh, in that direction. And uh, we're well on track with that uh, program. So we're um, working not only with the Gates Foundation, a number of other uh, you know, large uh, companies and, and uh, foundations and so on. And at this point, we're in 15 uh, countries uh, around the world. And so this is a very exciting uh, area of development. So a little bit of an advertisement. So if you want to hear more about the skin integrated electronics and what we're doing in that space and how you can use those same ideas to study sort of 3D tissue constructs, mini brains, and so on. I'll be giving another one of these um, webinar type talks next week, uh, Wednesday, uh, April 22nd at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, and the Zoom ID is uh, there on, on the slide. And so uh, if, if you wanna sort of dial in and, and listen to that presentation, it'll be much different than, than the presentation I'm giving uh, today. But it will also feature our most recent work, which involves deployment of adapted versions of those technologies onto COVID patients. So we're, we're deployed currently across the medical complex here in Chicago. We have devices that can continuously track respiratory behaviors, respiratory rate, respiratory sounds, coughing, coughing sounds, it's essentially uh, a digital stethoscope uh, that's operating wirelessly and continuously. And then layered on top of that, we have advanced uh, algorithms that, that allow us to extract key features from, from the data that, that allow us to um, track uh, patients as they progress through various stages of the disease. Uh, we can monitor their responsiveness to various therapies that are under evaluation. And we're doing that in the home. Uh, we additionally have uh, devices deployed onto physicians, nurses, uh, rehabilitation specialists here on the COVID floor at the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab. It's a very la large rehabilitation clinic here in Chicago. And so we can pick up very early signs of possible infection in that uh, sort of uh, you know, frontline set of um, healthcare professionals. And so I'll share a lot of the data that we're collecting. It's all unpublished, but it's a very exciting additional direction that we're pushing on very hard. Uh, started that work about, about a month ago, and we have about 50 devices and many gigabytes of data at this point and uh, pulling out insights in, in ways that, that, to my knowledge, are totally uh, unique. Uh, in, in providing insights uh, around this uh, terrible disease. So that's all I had to say as sort of the background. I guess I'm 20 minutes into the talk at this point. Let me um, kind of shift uh, gears to, to kind of the main thrust of this talk, which is uh, thinking about you know, devices that go, go beyond just biophysical measurements of physiological status. So going beyond measuring heart rate and heart rate variability and electrocardiograms and measuring blood oxygenation and things like that to think about you know, ways to tap into bi biofluids and, and biochemical signatures of health. And th this is kind of an obvious thing if you, if you think about you know, implants and, and a lot of the same ideas that, that apply to skin that I just walked you through, through immediately apply to you know, the original motivation that I laid out, which is brain integration, what you're seeing on the left cardiac integration. You can do a lot of these things and we're very active, many others uh, as well. But, but in those contexts, you're bathed in, in surrounding biofluids. And so you have immediate access to, to those fluids and you can think about biochemical sensors in, integrated uh, into these platforms. You see a pH, pH sensor is probably the simplest thing, but you can do a lot of things. You can measure uh, neurotransmitters, you can measure glucose concentration, a lot of different things. 
is there something analogous for skin interface devices? Um, you know, you might think about, you know, maybe something that punctures the surface of the skin. You could get interstitial fluid or maybe blood, and you can kind of do that, but it's invasive. Uh, it has the risk of causing infection, and so we decided this is probably not what we want to focus on. Uh, we want to keep things as minimally invasive as possible, especially if devices integrate with the skin. And so we and uh, many others at this point, you know, for sure, are thinking about sweat as a uh, novel class of biofluid that can be captured in a completely non-invasive way and um, a class of biofluid that has a lot of information content embedded in it. The, there are all kinds of uh, enzymes and proteins and electrolytes and, uh, and vitamins and, and so on that, that are in sweat. And, and if there were a way to capture tiny volumes of sweat in a pristine way as it emerges from the surface of the skin, uh, and then additionally ways to do the, the chemical evaluation on, on the sweat in situ, that might be pretty interesting as a way to complement the kinds of electronic biophysical sensing mechanisms that uh, I outlined previously. And so that got us started probably in 2014 or so in thinking about lab on a chip type technologies that, that could be built in skin compatible formats. So, so these are networks of micro channels, valves, reservoirs, colorimetric chemical reagents, electrochemical sensors, and so on that are all built in soft materials so that they can be adhered to the surface of the skin with a dual layer kind of uh, adhesive uh, with openings cut in certain regions to allow sweat glands in those corresponding locations to pump sweat up through the surface of the skin into inlets in the back side of this microfluidic platform where they can enter into this network of microchannels and valves and reservoirs and so on for capture, storage, and chemical analysis. That, that's, the, that's the idea where they could be built either with electronic functionality or without, because in a sense they're powered by the sweat glands. You don't need pumps because the sweat glands are the pumps. So they're moving the sweat up actively into these networks where uh, you, you can do, do some analysis. So, so that's the idea. Like I said, there are a number of other groups doing great work in sweat science. Uh, there's a long history of thinking about sweat, uh, but you know, if you look at conventional approaches, they're highly non-ideal. Typically, uh, absorbent pad taped to the skin, you peel it off, you wring it out, you get some sweat out, you do binge top chemical analysis, and that's kind of the way you do it. There are applications in the clinic, I'll come back to, to those, that use these kind of hockey puck style um, collection devices that uh, include a coiled up tube that sort of interfaces the skin, and then you uh, collect some sweat, and then you unwind the tube, and then you suck the sweat out into an instrument and, and do analysis. But, but I think a full integrated skin interface system would offer massive advantages compared to those conventional approaches. And there have been a number of papers roughly around the same time, a lot of things happening in 2016. Everybody seemed to publish their papers in 2016. Jason Heikenfeld at University of Cincinnati has been working in this area for a while. He's done some great work. But Ali Jivey's group at Berkeley, fantastic stuff. Uh, and Dae Hyun Kim at uh, Seoul National, but many others as well and, and different sorts of approaches. I think the uniqueness in what we're doing is we're using microfluidics. So it's not uh, simply an absorbent hydrogel or a uh, or a fabric or a sponge. It's full microfluidic lab on a chip technologies adapted for the skin. And, and we think that that's powerful because the lab on a chip community has been going now for 20, 30 years. And we can just adapt a lot of the, uh, you know, the, the capabilities that they've developed over time and drop them into these skin uh, 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 compatible systems. So this is the first example of a device of that type that we built is soft mechanics using the same kind of like serpentine structural ideas I mentioned in the context of electronics, but now uh, for microfluidics. So what this device involves is five inlet ports. Uh, one inlet connects to this serpentine channel, which has a colorimetric chemistry that changes from blue to red upon contact with water. So you can just visualize the fill front uh, immediately. You know the geometry of the channel. So at any given time, you can determine how much sweat has been lost from that part of the skin. And then it also involves four other inlets, each one of which connects to a separate reservoir, uh, circular reservoir here, uh, that are filled with colorimetric chemical reagents that are responding to different biomarkers in sweat, lactate, chloride, glucose, pH. So this is multifunctional 
no electronics. It's, and so it's just a molded piece of plastic in a sense with some special chemistries uh, embedded in it. And so you can think about it as a very low cost device. And I'll come back to that uh, idea in a little bit when I talk about commercialization. So as with um, the electronics, the mechanics are of paramount importance. And it's not uh, just a matter of a comfortable, irritation-free interface to the skin. Here it's even more important because you need a watertight seal. You can't allow leakage of sweat laterally, otherwise you lose all the accuracy and the, and the precision in the measurement of local sweat loss and sweat rate. So in order to uh, enable that kind of robust adhesion, you need to minimize the modulus, the effective modulus of the microfluidic platform, and you need to reduce, reduce its thickness and taper its edges. All sorts of concepts in mechanical engineering to minimize the interface stresses that would otherwise tend to drive delamination. And so, so this becomes a major aspect of uh, materials choices and, and design layouts. And here again, we work very closely with Young Gong Huang's group. He does all the modeling and provides all the guidance and the insight around the materials is a great collaboration. And uh, we study this at the very highest levels of uh, quantitative detail um, to, to, to optimize these things. But this is what it looks like. This is on the outer forearm of one of the graduate students working on the project. You can see that color change serpentine channel. In this case, you can see some sweat accumulated over here. It's merging from that region of the skin, moving up into that serpentine channel, and it is filled up to that point. And like I said, from that position, that angular position, you know exactly how much sweat you've lost from that small region of the skin. And you might ask, well, who cares how much sweat I lost right there? I care about how much sweat I've lost in total across my whole body. But it turns out you can calibrate it. You can connect this local sweat loss to full body sweat loss. And that turns out to be very powerful. And we published papers on that. I'll get back to that in a second. You can also see these four reservoirs have been filled uh, with a digital you know, imaging approach. You can pull out quantitative information on concentration, in this case, glucose, lactate, pH, and chloride. So here's a simpler device just to give you a sense of how this works. This is mounted on my inner forearm. It doesn't include the uh, colorimetric chemical analysis reservoirs. The channel geometry is a little bit different, but uh, it gives you a sense of it. So in this case, we've uh, put some uh, colored food dye at the inlet port locations. So it's adhered to my skin and I'm working out on an elliptical trainer uh, in, a, in, a, in my basement actually. So, so this is time, I started at 552. 610, I'm working out pretty hard. Now I can see sweat moving up into these channels and it's very easy to visualize that. 616, I got a little bit more. 619, more and more. 628, now I'm super motivated. Can I fill it up all the way? Uh, and I, I was able to do that. I almost killed myself make, making this happen, but I got it to the fill point at 635. And so you can, you can really just visualize your sweating. And the interesting thing here is that, you see that's a lot of sweat from that small region, but look at this. There's no sweat buildup on my surrounding skin. Why is that? That's because that sweat is evaporating all the time. You know, I'm here in Chicago, it's cold. It's, uh, you know, I'm, the sweat's evaporating. So the point is like, especially in arid climates, if you just sort of are looking at your skin, you lose track of how much sweat you've lost. And so dehydration becomes a problem. But one of these patches, you can determine quantitatively, precisely how much sweat you've lost from that local sweat uh, uh, loss uh, measurement. The interesting thing is you can also get sweat rate. So I just monitor the position of this fill front as a function of time and just plot it out. Cumulative sweat loss from that region as a function of time. There's a little bit of incubation period here. But then the interesting thing is once it gets going, my sweat glands are so precise. Look at this, it's almost perfectly linear. It's like the sweat release rate is constant to within experimental certainties, to within like two, 3%. It's like absolutely incredible. But anyway, I don't think anybody's ever measured that before, but uh, it turn, turns out that, that your, your sweat glands are uh, operating like clockwork almost, <laughs> at least mine are, I don't know about yours, but uh, anyway, you can, you can do this. So um, that's the most basic thing, sweat loss and sweat uh, rate, uh, very, very, very easy. And then uh, it, it comes to uh, chemistry in, in terms of uh, you know, getting uh, chemical composition of sweat. And I won't go through this because I don't have a, a lot of time, but, but there are different uh, chemical reagents that change in color uh, by an amount that's directly proportional to the concentration of a species of interest. So here's chloride. 
and this is over physiologically relevant range, by the way. This is 10 to, you know, 100 or so millimolar of chloride. And that's typical, but everybody's sweat has different chloride concentrations. Everybody's sweat has a different degree of salinity. These devices allow you to determine exactly how much electrolyte you have in your sweat. And this color change is very easy to read it out. As you can see, it's a very dramatic change over this physiologically relevant range. And so you can do digital uh, image analysis and so on, pull that out quantitatively. And you can do as well as HPLC type measurement of chloride. That is very easy. But you can also do more complex things. You can do glucose. So here's uh, an enzymatic assay for glucose. Again, colorimetric responding over a physiologically relevant range, about 100 times lower in concentration glucose and sweat compared to blood. Uh, but with this kind of chemistry, tailored for sweat is, is kind of what we spend our time on. Uh, you can do that measurement very accurately. Lactate, uh, same thing, different type of assay, but very strong color change. You, you can do all these things. Here's pH, that's even easier. Uh, and so you can get all these different parameters. There's probably a dozen different things you can do in this way. Creatinine, urea, I'll come back to that in a little bit. But it turns out to be a fairly versatile way to do multimodal analysis of sweat chemistry uh, without any electronics, without any battery, without any uh, cost associated with those uh, type, type of components. So how accurate is it? <clears throat> you want to benchmark against the conventional standards. So absorbent pad, sweat microfluidics, very nice correlation. Again, there's some scatter here, but we're talking about the human body. So the pad is not co-located with the sweat microfluidics. They're offset a little bit, and so there's some variability that follows from that, but, but very good correlation coefficient. Colorimetric, HPLC for chloride. Again, pretty good correlation given the intrinsic variabilities of the, uh, of the body. So you can quickly get electrolyte loss, sweat loss, and sweat rate. Very, very easy. What's that good for? Well, sports. Um, it turns out that uh, proper hydration, proper electrolyte balance is very important in sports performance and sports safety because if you're not well hydrated, you can cramp, you injure more easily. Uh, and so we were approached by Gatorade. Uh, and so probably everybody knows Gatorade. They're probably one of the world's largest suppliers of sports beverages. And, uh, you know, they're all about hydration, proper hydration. And so they got interested in using this technology to inform their customers how much Gatorade they need to drink to replenish lost water from sweat, but not just lost water, lost electrolytes as well because Gatorade has uh, electrolyte balance associated with it. And they're coming out with different types of Gatorade with different levels of electrolyte that you can tailor to your own body chemistry informed by uh, data coming from this sweat microfluidic uh, device. And so we got deeply engaged with them about a year and a half ago, went through a very rigorous uh, field testing program, accuracy, precision, reliability, adhesion tests, biocompatibility, on and on and on. Anyway, probably, about a thousand athletes, youth athletes, professional athletes have worn these devices and we've really proven it out. These are pro athletes on NFL teams, just to let you uh, get, get a sense. Uh, these can work even in contact sports. Here it is in baseball. These are pro games during actual game situations, which is pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, you can track sweat in that context, even swimming. Uh, and so you think about sweat in the context of aquatic sports, it's kind of weird in a sense, because what is sweat? What kind of benefit is sweat providing your body when you're underwater? Well, the answer is none, but your body doesn't know you're underwater. So it just activates the sweat glands. But at the same time, you're losing sweat. And so if you're thinking about elite competition in swimming or even just safety around cramping uh, in the pool or, or in, the, in the ocean or in a lake, for example, you'd like to know how much sweat you've lost. And you have no ability to do that in the pool because the sweat's constantly been washing off. But it turns out you can build waterproof sweat microfluidic devices, and you can wear them even in very vigorous competitions. And so we uh, have deployed these devices on the Northwestern uh, men's swim team, uh, and, and we, can, we can do that. We've even done it in triathlons, in Ironman trials. This is with uh, Gatorade Sports Science Institute. So you can track sweat loss through the aquatic of, uh, part of the event. This is in Kona, Hawaii. So this is in the ocean, pretty, pretty demanding. But then you can track it right through to the bike uh, race part of it and, 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 the, and the running race part, part of the competition as well. So very, very demanding conditions, but, but it works well. So we put it all together and we've launched a product with uh, Gatorade, very, very early phases of launch, but, but well on tr uh, track after these very rigorous technical milestones that we move through. This is the uh, form factor in the industrial design that the Gatorade folks put together. So <clears throat> you can see there are two channels here, two inlets, 
This straight channel is the chloride channel, uh, and you can see the purple color that's determining the uh, electrolyte concentration. And then the orange channel, the serpentine channel, is giving you sweat loss uh, information. So this was teased out in a first commercial spot that aired during NBA games on Christmas Day in uh, 2018. Uh, and so you can pull this up on YouTube. That's our device on Serena Williams, the tennis player. And I think this is a little bit old. It's probably up to 150 million views or so. It didn't really feature the device, but it teased it out sort of at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the commercial spot. But uh, at the NBA All-Star Game here in Chicago just a few weeks ago, they launched it in a more um, explicit manner. And so if you go to the Gatorade website, this is the top line on the website. That's Paul George. He's a starting uh, point forward for uh, the Los Angeles Clippers. And you can see our device is there. It's there. Nike has released a shoe with Gatorade that's paired with that device all around sweat anal analytics. And so it's, a, it's an interesting way to think about translation and uh, and I'll show the commercial spot that they aired during the NBA All-Star game. This is featuring Jason Tatum. He's a starting player for the uh, the uh, Boston Celtics and this really does uh, feature the the device and it's only like 30 seconds so I'll play that so you can take a look. Best in class athletes like NBA All-Star Jason Tatum are always looking to push their game forward. That's where a partner like Gatorade comes in. Gatorade has developed a first-of-its-kind wearable, the GX Sweat Patch, which is a new-to-the-world technology. The GX Sweat Patch measures personalized sweat rate and composition, letting athletes understand what they sweat out so they know what to put back in. So anyway, that, that's what's going on. So, so where are the research frontiers then? Like, what, what's next? And, and let me give you a sense of some things that we're working on now and we've published in the, in the very recent uh, past. So... You might think about ways to add active functionality to these platforms, right? Right now, as I've described them up to this point, it's just purely passive. Uh, all the power supply, in a sense, is coming from the sweat glands, uh, and that's it. And so there are advantages to that because you drive the cost down to, to a very, very low level. At full reel-to-reel -reel volumes, the cost of that patch is in the realm of a, a couple of tens of cents. And that's very, very important because we want them to be used in sort of a disposable manner, maybe recyclable manner, so you don't have to clean sweat out of your devices to reuse them. And you have all kinds of infection risk and, and other things. So there are advantages in passive, but uh, you're limited. So what about active? So there's been a lot of work in active microfluidic lab on a chip technologies. And our thought was, you know, what, what could you do? And there's some interesting things coming out of EPFL. Herb Shea, I've known for a long time, is a pretty cool pump. And George Whiteside, Steve Quake, and all, uh, and so on. But, but none in the context of sweat. And so you think about, can you, you know, maybe borrow some ideas, adapt them, kind of integrate them, do, do some in interesting things in, in that space. So all those technologies uh, that I showed you in the previous slide are great. But if you look at the supporting hardware, it's not like skin compatible in any obvious way. You got, you know, pumps and interfaces and external power supplies and things like that. So, so what could you do to, um, you know, enable active functionality without any of that extraneous hardware? What could you do at the level of material science design and maybe use manual actuation and that that's kind of what we decided to focus on so one some of these devices are great i showed you the ability though if you're if you're really motivated and you know for certain channel geometries you can fill the device up to the maximum point and then overflow it i mean we've designed it to be sort of one size fits all it's very very hard to do that but but in some cases may, maybe you could and um, in certain instances then it might be useful to be able to reset the device let's say you rehydrate at some point midstream in a competition you haven't filled up your patch wouldn't it be nice to just reset it you rehydrate it according to how much sweat loss you've measured in your in your microfluidic device if you could just reset it then you're uh, good to go you just keep going same patch so we thought about sort of manually activated pumps that would allow you to purge sweat out of your device to reset it in this way. And, and it involves uh, a valve that you can close with your thumb, uh, a pinch valve that allows one-way flow of fluids, and then taking advantage of the elastomeric construction of the device to, uh, to pull fluids out. That, that's kind of what we're doing. So this is what it looks like, an elastomeric suction pump. 
So it was just published a few weeks ago. Anyway, you can, you can pull on these uh, soft microfluidic systems and, and cause pressure differentials, and you can induce flow. And I'm gonna go through all the details. We did all the modeling work with Young Gong. All this stuff is quantitatively determined to a very high level of accuracy, but that's the basic concept in how this works. So that's the nature of the pump. Uh, you need a valve uh, in order to make it work so the sweat doesn't just move right back into your device when you release the, the tension. So we have a one-way valve. It's a, it's a strain activated valve based on a high aspect ratio. So thin. you can do that again, fully quantitatively studied, you know, uh, from, from a, a numerical modeling standpoint, I won't go through that. You also have to think in terms of reset, uh, a way to, to do this without uh, dyes. Uh, which I showed you before, because you consume the dyes. And so we've thought about optical structures, uh, retroreflectors built into the channels, uh, and you get an index matching effect when the sweat enters the channel. And if you have a black background, then you go from sort of a white reflective appearance to a black appearance as the sweat fills in. And so that, that works pretty well. So you put all that together, you have a resettable device. Uh, the channels, when they're not filled, it, it has sort of a white appearance from those retroreflectors as the sweat fills in uh, that re retroreflection effect is diminished very strongly and then uh, you visualize just the color of the base elastomer which is black in this case so here's what the device looks like sh a short movie showing its operation so it's partially filled up to there you pull it out sweat's coming out in this direction you release it the valve closes and now you've uh, reset your device you pull the sweat out a little bit on this side so that, that's, the way, that's the way it works. Very, very simple, but, but it works very well. What else could you do in terms of active? Well, you can build in power sources uh, from chemical reactions induced by sweat. And so here's an example of that, um, where we uh, were interested in developing um, a platform that would provide a physical sensation to an individual when they are approaching a level of dehydration. And so what does it look like? Here it is empty. This red uh, material here is a chemesthetic agent. So this is an agent that when exposed to the skin create, creates a tingling sensation, like a cooling sensation or sort of a, a slightly painful uh, sensation, capacin or, or menthol type, type uh, chemistries. This is a um, effervescent um, chemistry activated by sweat. So here you, here you go. So you're, um, losing sweat up to this point. Let's say you rehydrate, you reset, you just keep going. If you don't rehydrate, you continue losing sweat in, until the point where the sweat emerges into this uh, chemical pump. It activates that effervescent effect, which uh, releases gas that pushes this chemesthetic agent out of the device onto the adjacent skin and creates a physical sensation that's to alert the uh, athlete you need to rehydrate right away because you've lost too much sweat. That, that's the idea. So it's kind of a clever concept. This is a concept come up with a postdoc uh, who's doing the work, Jonathan Weeder, Reeder, but it really works. And so, so here it is, uh, it the sweat moves out here. You can see the menthol has been pushed out and you can really feel that. And so it's a physical uh, sensation uh, associated with dehydration. Uh, and, and so that works. So that's uh, athletics. What about uh, medicine? Ultimately, I was talking about human health and that's kind of a main orientation. What is sweat used for today in clinical medicine? It turns out that it's the gold standard for diagnosing for cystic fibrosis, in particular chloride concentration in sweat. And it's currently collected with these devices, the hockey puck devices I mentioned before with the co coiled up tubes. And uh, it works to some degree. The problem is it has a high failure rate associated with leakage of sweat. It doesn't form a very nice seal. So uh, pediatricians at Lurie Children's Hospital reached out to us and asked whether we could use our device in this application, get rid of this macro duct, build something that's much less prone to failure due to insufficient uh, sample collection, also doesn't require these uh, you know, tight straps to keep the device adhered, it's just a soft sticker in a sense, and a capability for doing onboard chloride analysis, so you don't have to pull the sweat out of the device and put it in the chlorodimeter, which you can see back here. And so that turned out to be super easy. So here's an initial uh, deployment of a device of that type uh, on, a, on a baby, 0% failure rate. We've been through, been through about 100 babies uh, do, doing this, capturing enough sweat, doing the chloride analysis. And so we're very excited about it. And it's really fun to work with this patient population, I have to say. This guy looks a little skeptical of this device, but, uh, but uh, it's, it's work, work, working very well. So here's another example 
It turns out, um, you know, we do one-to-one -one comparisons to MacroDuct. There's our device. You can see the greater, uh, you know, efficiency and sweat capture. And for these kids, you know, there's all kinds of opportunities to put graphics on, on, on top, and it really makes a difference. You can see that's um, uh, from, from the uh, Pixar movie uh, uh, Cars, and, and the kids love the uh, graphics and the stickers. And so, uh, anyway, it's a lot of fun. It's wor working very well. Here are comparisons between chloride evaluation using our devices, macroduct chloride, uh, very tight distribution there. So, so the accuracy is there, and the sweat collection efficiency is uh, better. So that's what it looks like. We've also paired with the National Kidney Foundation. Hydration is very important in the context of kidney disorders. Again, here, graphics are important. Anything that goes on the body, people care about what it looks like. So in this particular context, the National Kidney Foundation hired this guy, who's a celebrity tattoo artist, to make a custom tattoo that goes along uh, with, with our uh, device, and we deployed those on kidney patients. We also have um, colorimetric chemistries that allow us to read out urea, and creatinine and sweat, and these are biomarkers for kidney failure. And so not just managing hydration, but also maybe picking up early signs of kidney disease. So this is ongoing work and trying to understand how uh, sweat chemistry correlates to blood chemistry. But I think it's an interesting area of uh, research in human physiology enabled you know, by, by technologies of this, uh, of this type. So I won't go through the chemistry, but these are color metric readout schemes for those uh, uh, two species. So with the last um, two, three minutes, I'll, I'll give you uh, a couple of ideas around, you know, how you build in further sophistication. So I talked about active pumps and valves. There are ways to do passive valves as well. Again, bar just borrowing from the lab on a chip community, there are things called capillary bursting valves. And these are valves that, um, you know, burst at certain pressures defined by the geometry of the channel. Uh, according to these kinds of uh, models. So what this allows us to do is to route sweat systematically into different isolated reservoirs across the, the surface of the, the device. And in particular, if you build sort of a, a clock style uh, geometry here, you can uh, build in collections of capillary burst valves that route sweat in a way that sequentially fills up a series of reservoirs one after another. Why is that important? That allows us to capture sweat at different stages of a physical er exercise, different stages of a marathon, for example, where your sweat chemistry might be changing. And that might be uh, an important sort of time dependent effect that you'd like to capture, but in a way that doesn't require an electronic clock to be built into the device. So here's the way it works. So this is a movie. Capture time dependent information. So you put all that together, now you have multimodal measurement capability in terms of sweat chemistry, you're getting sweat rate, sweat loss, and you're getting time dependent changes in chemistry by use of these passive valves. So this is what a, a fully loaded platform looks like. This is what it uh, looks like in operation. So you have one inlet channel. This is capturing sweat loss and sweat rate, serpentine. This is sweat chemistry time dependent with these capillary bursting valves. So one reservoir, two, three, then this one fills these, this column uh, is doing uh, glucose, this is chloride, and that's lactate. Uh, and so you get, get the time dependence out uh, using this chrono sampling type approach enabled by capillary bursting valves. Super easy to integrate that kind of functionality. It's all just molded plastic. So retaining that low cost construction. So I think I'm at 52 minutes, which is about where I wanted to be uh, in terms of the, the time duration of this, this talk. And so I'll just conclude. I think you know, there's some pretty interesting research opportunities in material science, mechanical science, electrical engineering, even big data and data analytics as well, in thinking about new ways to integrate man-made microsystems technologies, electronics, microfluidics, microelectromechanical systems, optoelectronics with the body. And I think the skin is a great starting point because you can almost immediately get these devices deployed on real human subjects. And again, we're doing a lot in the context of COVID-19, and I'll be talking about that next Wednesday, uh, Wednesday next week, if you're interested. 
Uh, and so it's electronics, it's microfluidics. You can bring these things together. There are a lot of uh, different opportunities, a lot of potential for innovation as well. Uh, I think there's a decent amount of momentum. There's commercial traction, but there's huge opportunities for, for additional good ideas in, in academic research, probably mainly around the sensing component of these platforms. So, so uh, you know, if, if, if you're thinking about uh, directions, I, th I think the, these are, are very productive ones to, to consider. So everything that we do is fairly, uh, is very highly collaborative um, because it involves uh, groups with different areas of expertise, not, not just in engineering science. And I mentioned Young Gong Huang, uh, spectacularly productive uh, set of collaborations over the last 15 years, probably 300 joint papers with Young Gong uh, over, over time. I'm very proud of that. Uh, Ruz Ghaffari, uh, Arun Jar Jaramayan uh, on analytics, and then clinical medicine and sports. I think ultimately, if you want to do something important in engineering science, and uh, if it relates to medicine, you better be working with clinicians. Uh, if you want real traction or sports, you need to work with uh, high-level sports physiologists, and we're lucky to have these folks as uh, collaborators. But the most important people are the, are the students. I know there are a lot of students maybe on this call, and uh, they're the ones doing all the work and, and they're coming up with a lot of really great ideas. And I've been lucky uh, over the years to have really outstanding students, postdocs, grad students, undergrads as well. All of the kids with their hands raised, these are undergrads. They're deeply involved in our, our projects as well. Uh, and so I just like to conclude my talks by acknowledging them for their uh, hard work and uh, thanking you for your attention. Okay, great, John, your talk as always. I have to say that I tell you, you know, John, you need to get a little bit slowly, but you still run really, really, really fast. So, yeah, I, I think that's where I'm interested. So you remember on the, you know, we, uh, meeting room, yeah, we see that, but uh, the same, you know, as always, I was, you know, talk really fast, but you are much faster than me. So, <laughs> okay, anyway, great, great talks. Now, a lot of people was asking questions. We directly go to the question part, okay? Yeah. Okay, uh, there are too many questions. Okay, I choose some, okay. The first one, uh, uh, the first I want to report everyone, we have more than 7,000 people online was watching this, okay, from uh, many, many different places. So here we choose some of them. So first one is, hi, uh, Rogers, Professor Rogers. I'm a Ting Wang from National you know, uh, Technology University of Singapore. Very impressive talk. My question is about the calorimetric sensors. Is calorimetric sensors one-time usage? Uh, if so, how to realize a continuous testing? Okay, John, is this clear? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, some of these calorimetric chemistries are reversible. Most of them are not. Uh, and so it is really sort of a one-time evaluation. Um, if you're using these capillary bursting type uh, approaches and you're filling up separate reservoirs, each reservoir can be filled with uh, a colorimetric reagent. And so you can kind of get time dependent information in that way. But the, uh, but the reagent itself is not time dynamic in terms of its response to concentration at any given moment in time. It depends on the chemistry, but for the most part, they're not operating in that way. And so it is um, a limitation, I, I would say. And so with that limitation, there's also an opportunity, um, you know, to come up with chemistries that, that are fully reversible. That'd be very powerful, uh, you know. And, and so if there are people out there who have deeper chemistry expertise than, than we do in, in our group, you might want to think about that because it would be a very nice feature to, to embed in these devices. Then you could kind of get real-time feedback directly, you know, on how how uh, biomarker concentrations are, are changing in time. So, so that, that is uh, just an intrinsic feature of a lot of these uh, chemistries. Again, I think um, we like to view these sorts of devices as uh, recyclable, uh, that, that they, they don't need to be cleaned. I mentioned that uh, before for reuse because it gets a little messy with the sweat. And I think if you can keep the cost as low as possible, uh, that's very important. And so, you know, eliminating electronics, in, in our view, is, is very powerful in that context. Now, having said all of that, 
we do have a couple of publications where we demonstrate electronic integration. And if you're doing electrochemical sensing, then it's very easy to track in real time changes in concentration. And, and you can do that. And we have tried to think about a modular approach where the electronics uh, you know, don't necessarily come into direct contact with the sweat except at the electrochemical electrodes. And then uh, they can decouple from the microfluidic platform using kind of a magnetic coupling scheme that provides electrical interface, mechanical interface, but, but allows the, uh, the electronics to be reused with, without extensive cleaning. And then the microfluidic platform is, um, is recyclable or, or disposable. So, so that's a great question. Uh, I, I think it's uh, an area of opportunity, like I said before. The, the other opportunity more generally, if you think about colorimetric chemistries, there are a number of different um, assay kits that are, that are available, primarily uh, developed for interstitial fluid by uh, blood uh, analysis. And, and we've used those kinds of chemistries as starting points for everything that we've done uh, and just adapted the chemistry to apply to concentration ranges that are relevant to sweat. But there's no reason in principle you should be limited by that. I mean, I think there are you know, chemists out there who could probably uh, conceive of, of new types of assays to look, look at you know, species that are uniquely present in sweat. We have um, demonstrated, like I said, probably a dozen different uh, species that can be detected, but you're know, measuring cortisol, for example, would be very powerful if you could do that with a colorimetric approach because it's a stress marker. And that would, that would be a uh, very high interest. Anyway, many, many different things uh, could, could be done uh, in, in that area. So I, I appreciate that question. Thank you. Okay, great answers. Okay, I think your background was mixed. You know, you have a, a physical and you have chemistry background, so you can do all these things. Yeah. So uh, the second question is from Shanghai Jiao Tong University. The name is Zhao Lin Chuan. I think this question is look like ask, ask me because he said I'm interested in the self power sensor system. But there are many problems in the current, you know, uh, energy harvesting system. Uh, which uh, could not achieve the ideal applications. I would like to ask about the prospect of the self-power sensor in home human body. Thank you very much. Uh, John, if you don't mind, I will answer these questions, okay? Sure. This much, yeah. yeah, this much more about my major, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so yeah, uh, this, uh, this uh, Lin Chuan, uh, you are right. There are too many problems for the, you know, energy harvesting system, but, uh, you know, everything at the start will keep on going. So all this energy harvesting, you know, now is much better than five or two years ago. So I think all the kind of technology can be developing, developing. And uh, another way is you see that all this device, the power consumption is getting lower and lower. So sooner it will be connected. Yeah, I think that there'll be uh, much more things if we, we can do more to, you know, hybrid all this kind of movement, you know, like me, I was running every day. So if we can pick up all this energy, get the efficiency better, I think that'll be solved the problem. So don't worry about it, keep on going. And uh, each technology can, you know, have better futures. Okay. That's my job. Okay, uh, John, did you have anything to comment on this? No, I think it's a really interesting research direction and there are a lot of things happening, piezoelectric based mechanisms, thermoelectric, triboelectric. Uh, there are a lot of different uh, routes to, to consider. Um, I think in many cases for harvesting, the power that's captured is intermittent. And so in many cases, you probably need some kind of local storage capacity like a supercapacitor or battery to pair with the uh, energy harvesting unit. But I, th I think it's an interesting direction. We haven't done a lot like you're suggesting, Alice. We've done, done some in, in piezoelectric, published a few papers, but I know there are very uh, large scale efforts in China around triboelectric. It looks like it's a very yeah. promising Me. type yeah. of technology. <laughs> yeah, I was doing much of, uh, more about that. We can mm -hmm. collaborate later. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the third question is from Shanghai Jiao Tong University too. Uh, Hai Ping Yi. So he's asked uh, ask about the epidermal sensors, you know, often fabricated by the polymers. How to deal with uh, kind of polymer issues is for the reduced response, always delays for the whistle elastic, uh, elastic, you know. So any comments on this? Well, yeah, I mean, I think, um, 
maybe the broader question there is what classes of materials are, are most well suited to these types of uh, device platforms. Maybe, maybe that's one way to frame it. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, I think there are a number of very, very high quality research groups, a large number by, by now, um, working on various classes of skin interface uh, devices. And some, some groups are focusing on uh, organic based electronic materials. And, and I think that's interesting. We, we've worked in that area, uh, you know, ourselves, you know, over time. Um, various kinds of composites, you know, nanotube and two, 2D material type, type approaches. Um, you know, uh, e even quantum dots and, and films made of quantum dots lo look attractive as kind of semiconductor components of these uh, platforms. Um, and we've looked at all, all of those options and, and I think they're interesting and they're great. Um, I would say for us, the best sort of um, traction that, that we've had is, is to adapt and um, I guess re reformulate and, and uh, deploy in unusual ways conventional materials. So, so materials that are aligned with the existing electronics industry. So gallium nitride, gallium arsenide, indium phosphide, silicon, but, but not in sort of wafer type platforms in, in nanoscale um, structures. So, so very thin membranes, wires, ribbons, that, that kind of thing. Um, because you, you're, you're immediately tapping into to very sophisticated, well-known types of materials with, with exceptional performance characteristics. And if that's your starting point, it's a little bit, it becomes more straightforward or more feasible to build in the sophisticated types of functionality that you ultimately need. You know, um, for our um, work in the NICU, so with these premature babies, um, the doctors and nurses are not interested in anything that doesn't match the accuracy and the precision and the reliability of the technologies that they have now. So for them, getting rid of wires, if getting rid of wires means lower quality data streams, they won't do it, you know? And so you have to be operating at a very high level of accuracy and precision. And so maybe to the point of the question, I think polymers are interesting. They, they drift, they creep, they um, vary in their properties. The threshold voltages uh, drift. There are uh, bias stress effects. There are humidity effects. There are temperature uh, impacts. And so when you think about different types of materials, I think you have to try to choose the best material for what you're trying to accomplish. And for, for me, I personally feel like the organics and the polymers and maybe the nanotubes and stuff, they probably have very powerful utility at the, at the sensing interface, not so much for me anyway, at the level of reproducing what silicon does in a microprocessor or a memory module or a radio communication unit. I mean, it's very hard to kind of, you know, make, make that argument. I mean, there are pe people who, do it, who are doing that, but, but you know, I think um, you, you just have to balance the considerations and maybe, maybe certain applications would, would be well matched, but, but I think there are great, research efforts and uh, as the field develops, I think maybe these polymer-based approaches become more and more viable uh, as alternatives uh, to, to silicon. But if your ultimate goal is applications, you kind of have to take a hard-nosed look at, you know, the performance attributes, the, the stability and so on, and, and ask yourself what's, what's going to be the, the, the most, you know, successful uh, approach from, from a material standpoint. I, ultimately, I think it's a hybrid integration that's going to be the the solution. So silicon for what it does well, polymers, other things for maybe distributed systems, the sensing interface, and so on. So I think there's plenty of room for research along both uh, both tracks, inorganic and and organic as well. Okay, great answers. Okay, this is related to the next questions because this question is about your swab sensors. He asked about the accuracy. So how accurate is the measurement about the glucose level in the body can be measured by the sweat? And uh, can we measure other chemistry, you know, depending on our body's performance in one fixed pattern movement? Okay, is that okay for you? Yeah, that, that's another great question. Lots of good questions. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy about this. So um, what is the accuracy? It really depends on, um, you know, the quantity you're trying to measure. So with uh, chloride concentration, our accuracy is a couple of millimolar um, accuracy un uncertainty. Uh, and that's pretty good, actually. And, and you think about, you know, applications for screening for cystic fibrosis or um, 
you know, tracking electrolyte loss in sports and, and athletic competitions, it's good enough. You, you actually match the kind of accuracy that is obtained in, in a clinic using a chlorodimeter. Uh, and you, you match the HPLC approaches that have been used in sports physiology uh, in the past. So there's no problem with, with chloride. And um, I think partly because of that and partly because applications in athletics don't require approval from regulatory agencies and it's not, you know, kind of a uh, a regulated uh, type type of environment that that was a great starting point for for translation. It's very very low hanging fruit. So so that that's the answer in that particular context. I think the question embedded something about glucose. And so for glucose, uh, I think I mentioned in my talk uh, the glucose concentration, physiological concentrations in sweat, about a hundred times lower than in blood. And so these colorimetric assay kits, you have to modify them in a smart way for them to offer a relevant response over that very low concentration range. But that turns out not to be a problem. You, you can do that. The bigger, the bigger problem is how does sweat glucose correlate to blood glucose? Nobody knows. I mean, this is something that's on, under investigation now, but, but sweat is a very underexplored class of biofluid compared to blood or interstitial fluid. And I think partly because it's just been a messy type of fluid to get access to, to collect. You have pat, absorbent pads and tapes, and you have these sort of uh, instruments that you scrape the, the sweat off of the surface of the skin. And when you do that, you know, the sweat gets contaminated with exfoliated cells from the stratum corneum and uh, sebum and oils from the skin. It's just messy. And so I think historically, it hasn't been studied very carefully for those reasons, but I think our efforts, efforts of other groups in this area are really changing that dynamic uh, from the standpoint of uh, technology that, that allows collection of pristine aliquots of sweat at different locations on the body, at different points in the sweating with quantified values of sweat rate because the rate can actually change the concentration as, as you might imagine. So. So it's non-trivial. You have to have the right engineering systems in place in order to do the studies uh, in a valid way. But ultimately, I think there's a real opportunity to study correlations between sweat chemistry and sweat glucose uh, to sort of answer, answer the underlying bi biology questions of, of how you know, species move through diffusive channels from the blood to the sweat. I would say um, the early studies correlating sweat glucose to blood glucose indicate that there's not a rigid fixed correlation. It, there tends to be a, a time lag, a time delay. You will see changes in blood glucose before you see those changes in sweat glucose. And I think that's just an effect of the kinetics of, of the diffusive processes that are moving glucose from the blood uh, in, into the sweat. But some species are very tightly linked. So small molecules, ions, they're very um, you know, much matched between sweat and blood because they diffuse very rapidly. So alcohol, caffeine, electrolytes, a number of these species are well, well uh, correlated. So I think the question is not so much how accurate you can measure these quantities, but what those concentrations really mean uh, in terms of health status. What do they mean in terms of corresponding concentrations in the blood. I mean, I, I would say to first order that that's probably one of the bigger challenges, but that doesn't sort of, you know, encompass all, you know, types of biomarkers that you might want to measure in sweat. The ones that we can measure, we can measure very accurately. It's not a limitation, but there are lots of uh, species that we can't measure at all. And, and, and I think there, you know, you can't even ask the accuracy question because you can't even measure them to, to, to begin with because there aren't any color metric reagents available. So I think if there are chemists on the line or thinking about it, it would be great if we had a broader, you know, toolbox, you know, of, of color metric chemistries for, for doing sweat analysis. That, that would be fantastic. And, and we're not, you know, kind of in a position to develop things at that level. I mean, you have some chemistry expertise, but that's not the core of what we do. So, so I think it'll be other groups, other you know, teams that, that'll be able to push, push those capabilities forward more, more effectively than, than, than we would. Okay, great. So the comes to the next question is of, uh, from EPFL, Hao Tian. He's asking for uh, questions for the software wearable electronics. 
As you mentioned, a lot of research works have been done in this you know, field, including the material science, fabrication, different vital signals, detection, and uh, centrist oil. Could you please talk about some perspective of this field from your experience? What kind of problem are still waiting to be solved? What are the potential research directions in this field? Okay, John? Uh, yeah, great, great question. So um, I would agree there, there are lots of groups, there are lots of academic teams, there are startup companies, there are larger companies, even Google has been thinking about, you know, data analytics around digital measurements of, of health status. I, th I think there are a lot of um, exciting things happening. I, I think it's a very dynamic, fast moving field. I would say with the pandemic, it's only going to intensify. You know, I, I think it's going to, it's probably going to change academic priorities in a profound way for at least a generation. That That's my guess. And, and it's going to uh, reemphasize and reorient, you know, research um, to an even greater degree around problems related to biology and human health. And I think um, wearable technologies, generally speaking, are going to play a very important role. Um, uh, you know, the simplest thing is just to be able to track disease outbreak. You know, if everybody is wearing an ICU grade, you know, monitoring system, and it has to be uh, imperceptible at the end of the day, otherwise people won't use it. So it has to be something you, you put on your body and you forget that it's even there. And it's making sophisticated, high accuracy, reliable measurements, wirelessly streaming, locally uh, storing, um, and, and that, that's the way it's going to be. And, um, you know, as I'll describe in my talk next week, there's some pretty interesting insights that you can capture around cough, cough intensity, cough frequency, cough sounds, respiratory sounds, respiratory rate. You can track all of these things uh, in real time uh, and continuously. And um, so I think, you know, back to the, the, the question, I, I think that, um, you know, it's, it's having the potential, and it's not just me, you know, ev evangelizing. There are ma many people, I think Eric Topol has been a, a thought leader in this area for, for a long time. There, there are many things that will become possible if, if you can do hospital grade uh, monitoring uh, continuously in the home. Because if you think about the way care is done uh, currently, it's episodic. You, you, you aren't being measured uh, unless you go into the, the hospital. That's the only time that, that you're really, your body processes are really quantified in any way that a physician can in interpret. I mean, your know, Fitbit is counting steps, but who cares about steps? I mean, a, a physician doesn't know what to do with that. So, so it's episodic and um, you're not really capturing the full trajectory and richness around the, the health of an individual. So, so the motivation is to uh, go qualitatively beyond that. And along with that, uh, comes enormous data streams and huge, um, you know, opportunities to develop machine learning and, you know, all kinds of algorithms, right, to extract insights and make predictive assessments of trajectories and, and all this kind of kind of stuff. So, so I think, generally speaking, it's going to be a rich, vibrant, active area of research into the foreseeable future, only enhanced further by, by the kind of uh, situation we're, we're uh, facing uh, today. And, and I think the academic community is going to be essential uh, in, in driving uh, progress because things that can happen in an academic lab are way outside of the realm of what you know, a startup can do and, and even a large company can do. So, so I think um, you know, I, I have a very um, optimistic view on, on what's going to be possible in the future and how academic research is going to be able to, uh, to contribute to that. But, but you know, the, the question is around frontiers. I mean, I think we're just scraping the surface. So, I mean, I was trying to describe it uh, in the talk. I mean, like step one is reproduce measurements that physicians understand. You know, you're going to have to do ECG and it's going to have to do PPG, you know, and, and you're going to have to have clinical grade temperature, like the basics. But why stop there? You, you, if you have a, a skin compatible platform, you have all the infrastructure, the wireless, the, the memory, the, the processing, all this stuff. What new guidance of sensors can, can you think about? What kind of biochemical uh, sensing uh, is possible? You know, we, we've been working on flow sensors, for example. You know, the, the kind of things that are done in the clinic, they don't involve flow, but like the body is full of flowing fluids. Like why shouldn't we be measuring and looking at and thinking about flow? You do blood pressure, but you don't do flow. You, you do it 
with a laser Doppler, but it, but it doesn't work very well and it's not a routine standard of care. Could you do a flow meter? you know, in these devices, something we've been th uh, thinking about and, and working on and uh, all kinds of applications. Any, anyway, it's huge. I mean, I, th I would say you could go on and on different different kinds of things to uh, to think about at the level of the materials and the and the sensors, but then even higher level stuff around data analytics. So that was a little bit disorganized, I guess, maybe in my response, but uh, I think it's partly because, um, you know, it's just infected by my own uh, enthusiasm and, and um, you know, um, perception that there are just m many different uh, directions that, that one could go and, and ways that one could uh, contribute. Okay, great. So, John, this is the last question. Okay, this is very, uh, very important because this student was from Wuhan, Huadong University of Science and Technology. Uh, he's going to ask for the, you know, you know, now the new coronavirus is all over the world. Uh, get more people so we infect and get bad. How will, uh, will all this kind of flexible and wearable electronics can help in the hospital uh, for the nurse and the doctors to prevent or try to kill all these verses? Okay, could you give comments on this? Um, I would answer <laughs> two, two, two ways. One is um, my talk next week will get into deep, deep details around what we're doing uh, with, with our skin interface sensors on COVID-19 patients, uh, physicians, nurses, rehabilitation experts here in Chicago. And uh, we have uh, a large number of devices deployed. We've been working very hard on this the last three, four weeks. It's based on a technology that we just published in Nature Biomedical Engineering in February. It's a very, very new technology, but we've been able to deploy it. And uh, we set up a HIPAA compliant cloud server, automated analytics, graphical display for the physicians. The idea is twofold. One is to monitor um, individuals who are at risk for exposure uh, to the virus. So, so those are the healthcare professionals, the frontline folks, and to uh, monitor signs that, that of early symptoms. I mean, all, everything about controlling the outbreak is detecting things early and then acting vigorously. And um, if you're waiting for people to tell you they're sick, maybe it's too late. You got to pick it up earlier. And so what can you do in terms of digital biomarker sensing that would give you that early warning sign? That's number one. Uh, and I'll be talking about that next week. Number two is once you have the disease, what is the progression? What is the nature of how you uh, recover or how you don't? You know, can you monitor, you know, cough intensity, cough frequency, coughing sounds, respiratory sounds as an individ, infected individual progresses through different stages of the disease, that, that would be one. And, and what kind of insights could you gain in terms of uh, what is the optimal uh, care delivery system on an individualized uh, basis, uh, quantified, you know, not, not just a nurse listening to cough or asking the patient, how often are you coughing today compared to yesterday, but pulling up the quantitative data on that. You, you can capture it, right? It's not a, not a uh, you know, a thing, thing that can't be, uh, qu quantified and and maybe even more importantly, g given where we are in in the condition, there's dozens of therapies and therapeutics and pre preventatives that are being studied right now. Could you bring quantitative data science to bear to evaluate the effectiveness? You know? And so, so that's kind of um, kind of what we're doing. But but the devices are not themselves providing therapy. These are sensing devices, and so. I think a new frontier in this area is to think about the devices not only as a sensing platform, but a platform for delivering therapy. And um, we're just getting started in that direction. I think other people are uh, as well, other groups, but it's relatively untouched, I, I would say. And, and it's a very natural direction to, to think about. We're not doing anything like that, certainly in the context of COVID-19, but, but I think there are creative ideas that could be brought to bear to allow sensing plus therapy and then doing that in a clo close feedback type of approach would, would be a, a really powerful type of uh, technology that's going to require some great ideas and some great academic research. Okay, great answers. Okay, uh, actually there are still many other questions, but due to the time limitations, this time we couldn't put all the questions here. But I have a uh, happy to announce that we now we have more than 8,000 people, you know, on the, yeah, on this radio show, on this online show. So it's so happy we are collecting all these questions. Maybe we send the list to you. 
this may be also help you for prepare next week's talk. And I think, you know, John, we may should invite you again, you know, to give a talk. You have so many things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, can share with us. And it's true for the VIP, they have many questions, but I have to control the time. We still have another speaker, so I can you. Yeah, I think now is a special time. We will give you a special gift. Okay, now it's the time, you know, can my helpers to, yeah, give this virtual, you know, yeah, talks to you. So, John, I know you're always the opening speaker, so you always, you know, do everything ahead at once. So this time I couldn't, you know, deliver this certification to you on site, but I want to deliver this number one, you know, I can talk show. Uh, to you. So because you are so good, you tell the whole world how the high tech changes the world. You are the best demos. Now let's, you know, please, you know, give a warm welcome to and thanks to John Rogers. Yeah, I will deliver this to you later. Yeah. So okay. Hi everyone. John. Yeah, this is for you. Okay. Number one. Always. Thank yeah. Thank yeah. Everyone. Much. Yeah, yeah. I'm so in the, in, yeah, I'm number one in the response speed on emails. That's what I did well here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So please, you know, once you get to, you know my email response in seconds. Okay. Now, John responds that email in minutes. If you respond in seconds, okay, then you will be number one. Okay. Now next time. <laughs> yeah. So John, thank you so much. Yeah, I think we control the time very good. Uh, so we couldn't answer all these questions, but your talk was fantastic. You know, give everyone such a big picture and so many great examples. I think we'll be more happy, you know, to move on. And uh, we thank you again, and uh, we will, you know, have a five minutes break. Uh, I think one and a half hours. So everyone was kicking here, couldn't move, you know, focus all on the skin. So now it's a five minutes break. You can, you know, get a little bit of rest, uh, you relax. Then come back at uh, 9.40. So we'll start. Our next speaker is Tony Huang. He's a super young scientist. Yeah, he will give another fantastic talk. So please come back five minutes later, 9.40. Okay, now we got, you know, a little bit reset. <laughs>